put out that the sun shines down its power to all the world and makes the wind blow strong as it will. I want to hope gentle rains can fall upon the land so lovely earth can stay lovely still. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the 396th edition of Energy Week with George Harvey and the amazing Tom Fennell. Who wants a Shelby Cobra? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's time for a Shelby Cobra, maybe. That'll be our first issue. Before I, before I start, I should say a few things. We're starting the show, we're recording it on the 3rd of December, and we're starting it with news from the 25th of November. So we'll do the 25th of November through the 2nd of December. This all comes from my blog, geoharvey.com, and you can go there and find these uh, these articles that we're going to be talking about, um, geoharvey.com, or you can uh, click on links that are provided by BCTV. Um, one goes to the, uh, the website that Tom and I use to develop a script, and another one goes to, uh, I guess, a downloadable file that that uh, provides um, the same script that you can you can download. Um, well, well, some of these are worth looking at or worth reading yourself. And some of them are very long and very informative, and I'll try to alert you of it. And yeah. if you got the time, look them up. That's right. Now, before we go, I sh- uh, go on. I should say that um, we at uh, we at Energy Week and BCTV are looking for donations to keep everybody going. Uh, BCTV is not cheap to run, and the, the directors of the shows are responsible to raise a certain amount of money every year. Um, this year, for me, it's $480 to keep the show going. That sounds like a lot, but it, it's really less than $10 per show. And when you consider the amount of support we're getting from BCTV on this, that's peanuts. Um, but nevertheless, I have to ask people to to donate and the way to do that, if you'd like to donate anything up of, upwards of a dollar, um, you know, would be to go to brattleborotv.org, and I'm not going to spell that out. It's just Brattleboro TV. There's no hyphens or spaces. It's Brattleboro spelled out completely and TV.org. And when you go there, on the top of the screen, on the right side, there's a kind of an orange box that, that you can click on to donate. And that will take you to a point where you can donate um, – by credit card or by um, uh, PayPal. I think PayPal is the is the preferred method. At least that's what I kind of heard. Well, if but, you got PayPal, it usually works pretty well. Yeah, and what the one thing that I will say is, um, as you go through, there's a couple of screens to determine the amount that you're giving and so forth. At one of those screens, right below where the amount shows up. Um, there's a there's a thing that th- there will be a uh, a place that you can fill in further information about the donation and for that just say that it's to support um, Energy Week. Uh, there are other ways to make donations, but this is probably well, there is another way. You could take unmarked twenty dollar bills and slip them under my door. <laughs> yeah, if you do that, Tom will make sure that they go to BCTV. Okay. <laughs> We should start the we should start the show as I said we're starting it on Wednesday November 25th. We have a picture of of a, of a Shelby Cobra, and this article is from Clean Technica. Well, Superformance, the name of a company, is building an all electric Cobra for 2021. Yeah. And by the way, there's a video here, but it's eh, it's not a great video. <laughs> Thanks for the. For the uh, review. Well, there is a video. It's short, but it, it's it's not inspirational. Okay. Superformance claims it has a license from Shelby himself to build a quote official end quote uh, continuation Cobras, and this is just stunning. A few things it does not have are shiny roll bars, a rumbling side-mounted exhaust, and a gaudy hood scoop for feeding air into the, into the engine bay of the 427. And um, this is a, a really impressive uh, uh, sports car. So, well, the original guess, one was quite quite impressive. The original one was impressive. But uh, would, from the article, this isn't just pretty. 
the boutique car maker version, which we're talking about, is expected to be a serious performance car. Serious performance. Do you remember what the figure was for zero to 60? No, I don't, but it's quick. <laughs> yeah, it's quick. My recollection, I don't have it in front of me, but my recollection was that it was two seconds. I wouldn't argue that. It was definitely in that area, 2.3 maybe. Yeah, maybe. So it's this is an impressive car. Now, of course, the reason why we're talking about this is because it shows you these electric cars are not they're not trivial. They're not slow. They're not uninteresting. They're, they're not only that, baby. They're here to stay. Yeah, they're here to stay, all right. And by the way, we've got another one just coming up. Do you want to go to that one next, Tom? No, I got. Let's stick with them in order here. Or you mean well, the uh, thing about I the mean, uh, energy efficient vehicle? Yeah, the ener energy efficient. Yeah, vehicle. yeah. Let's go. Let's move to that one. This one is also clean technic. It's it's. We have a picture here of the Eximus um, Four. Um, and it, this is a, an energy effect. This is unbelievable. That's what they say. The Exodus 4 is the world's most energy efficient electric vehicle. The electric vehicle you see here with this picture is. It's sitting on rails to make it a little bit less, uh, use it, a little bit more energy efficient. A little bit. I, well, actually, rails are a little bit better, better than the rubber tires on the ground. They sure are. Built by a team of experts at Sweden's Dal uh, Dalarna University, it is billed as the world's most efficient EV. Now, this is the part that's unbelievable. It can transport a person nearly halfway around the world. I don't believe it. There's no railroad track going that far. Using the energy in a single liter of gas. That's like you can go tw uh, 12,000 miles on on a on a on a quart of gasoline, you could go around the world twice on one gallon. <laughs> it's pretty efficient. It's well, a single not... person Eximus Four uses about this. Is what they say a half one hour per kilometer of travel. I think that's a mistake. I think it should be a kilo, half a kilowatt hour. No, it's not... a one hour is is tiny. Uh, it's like is, picking up a in, pencil. In order to, in order to get that far on that yeah. on that. A quart of gas, a half watt hour would be correct. But it might be, is, but that's a tiny. Half, a half watt hour would 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 keep my Raspberry Pi computer going for um for for like six minutes. This is just an incredible amount of, and, and the Raspberry Pi is unbelievably efficient. You know, this, this the the amount of electricity that you get. By running a toaster to toast a, a, a slice of bread would keep a toaster's the, about seven hundred watts. So yeah, I mean, so we're talking about hundreds of miles on that amount of electricity. I don't they know. How compare they it to car headlights and car, a typical car headlight. One headlight is sixty watts. Right. So and you know what a sixty watt bulb looks like in a house, you know? Yeah, and and sixty watts. If this is a half, half watt hour for what a kilometer? Yes. That means that that, means that, that, that running a, the, the headlight of one headlight of a car for one hour would use the amount of electricity that would, that would be required to drive this thing um, um, uh, 120 miles. Well, we're all in agreement. This is a very efficient vehicle. It, 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 that's what they were trying to do, but, you know, what can I say? So are you, have we beaten let's, that? Let's move along here. we got some funny-looking things. I wonder what they are. <laughs> I think they're wind turbines, Tom. Is that what they are? I'll I, be darned. I, I've are. never seen a wind turbine. Well, the title <laughs> on the picture says NL wind turbines. NL, by the way, is... Didn't we both visit wind turbines in eastern and western Vermont one time? Well, you, you, was that you with me? You and I went to a wind farm. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah, okay. There's a few of them around. Okay, uh, what do you have for a title on this? It's from oilprice.com. It's European utility giant to invest $190 billion, that's a lot, baby, in renewable infrastructure. Yeah, Italy's NL, which, by the way, is, the, is Europe's largest utility, announced plans to invest as much as $190 billion dollars which is 160 billion euros, by 2030, which means an average of $19 billion a year, boosting renewable energy generation, decarbonization, and grid infrastructure, 
as part of a new plan to become a super major in the renew in renewable energy. It's this is the biggest um, utility in Europe, and they want to become a super major. Does this? They're operating in the states too, you know. Yes, I know. They're very, very. They're all over the world. Yeah. So and yeah. now expects its total installed capacity in renewables to reach 120 gigawatts. 120 gigawatt. Remember, gigawatts is gigawatts, baby. By 2030, which is 2.7 times higher than it is currently installed. Yeah. So it's pretty ambitious. It's ambitious, but you know what, Tom? You've been saying a, big, a gigawatt is a gigawatt, but lately we've seen numbers go by that go to terawatts, and a they're getting there. <laughs> yeah, this is this is getting to be uh, really kind of outrageous in its size. So, we done with that one? Yeah, we're done with that one. Meanwhile, don't sell your oil stock, huh? <laughs> yeah, right. Okay, we're up we to got Thursday. a picture coming up of peatland in Scotland. Yeah, and we're up to Thursday, November 26th. And this is an item from Renews. Peat study sets out wind farm benefits. A study shows the benefits of wind farms to Scotland's peatlands. Uh, wind power and peatland enhancing unique a habitats. It's a is the name of the study. It looks at more than 2.5 million pounds. That's money of work by uh, three renewable energy businesses restoring peatland sites. So we, we've got businesses operating in in Scotland and they're restoring the peatlands. Uh, Help yeah, after the peat has been mined. Yeah. These, these are these are peatlands that have have had the peat taken out over the course of history. Probably started well, certainly that that was a process that started many hundreds of years ago. Healthy peatlands remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and store it. I've I've always I've just been astonished at the amount of carbon dioxide that can be drawn down by peatlands. The article mentions that it's a, on an acre by what does it say acre by acre? It's thirty times as much as as forest. Well, I don't have the whole article in front of me now, but it's very much something like what you just said. Yeah, it's it's an impressive amount of carbon. And what's happening... Well, all it is is a whole bunch of basically grass growing, you know, and well, it's the, sucking the uh, oxygen out of the air, or sucking yeah. the carbon dioxide out of the air, and growing. Well, peat, you know, though, then, it, then it falls back in, and a peat land is, is like one step above a swamp. Peat is a is a specific al, uh, al, algae type sphagnum it's called, and sphagnum grows on the surface of the water and it kills everything under it. it I mean, there's not a lot, there's no fish under that sphagnum in a, in the swamp. Um, it it has antibiotic properties and it's been historically used to to pack wounds and things like that to prevent infection. But the peat draws a lot of oxygen out of the air and then. When it dies, which it does because... It draws, draws CO2 out of the air. Draw, drawing carbon dioxide, I'm sorry. You're right. When it, it, As it does this, it makes more green stuff at the t surface of the water, which means the peat that's already grown gets pushed farther and farther down into the water and eventually dies because it can't get any light. And this is a process that just keeps going. And that peat... Well, if you do it long enough, it turns into coal. Yes. <laughs> a couple of million years here and there. Among friends. What's that? A couple of million years here and there among friends is nothing much. Yeah, I think you're probably right. But it, this is an impressive process. And, you know, I've been thinking we should be, we should really be, um, rest, we could restore peatlands, we could put peatlands where they never existed. What There's I mean peatlands right now out, out on the Cape. That's where the cranberries are growing. Yeah, yeah. Where you drive, you drive along in the in the fall, and you see red fields. Yeah, the cranberries are all red. Yes. Okay. We, should we go on? Yeah, we got a picture there of the Arctic Na Na National Wildlife Refuge. This is an important article. It is. Um, and what do you have for a title to the article, Tom? Trump's last ditch effort to drill the Alaskan wilderness. You know what? I heard him talking about this exact thing on Vermont Public Radio today. Did you? Yeah. Well, this, is, this is from Clean Technica. We're still on Thursday of last week. The Trump administration is making a last minute push to sell oil rights in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge 
Firms can now select which swath of pristine Alaskan wilderness they would like to drill, and they can build a, bid on leases before President Trump leaves office in January. If I were in business, I don't think I'd invest in leases in Alaska. Well, a lot of the business comp- a lot of the businesses are with you on that. They're staying away from this. The big yeah. guys are anyhow. Major lenders. Yeah, which means that the ones that are planning on actually being involved are the little guys who have to borrow a lot of money from, I will say, unsuspecting lenders to to uh, to do the work, and they have a record of of they have a record of being able to make small fortunes. Do you know how you make a small fortune? You st- start with a big fortune and manage it badly. <laughs> Well, it's Arctic National Wildlife Refuge is in the northeast corner of Alaska. It's the largest wildlife refuge in the country. It's yeah. roughly the size of Maine. Yeah. And there's a matching Canadian area, just the other side of the border, that matches it exactly. In 2017, Congress authorized drilling in an area that is thought to contain 10 billion barrels of oil. However, Biden has pledged to protect the ANWR and will ban new drilling on public lands. Major Uh, lenders will not fund drilling in the Arctic. We've talked about that. Yeah, we have. And it's, you know, this is a this is this is a a a political move that um, is encouraging what I can only call really, really iffy investment. Well, it is a political move. There's no doubt about that. And what it says is this would be a complete industrialization of the wildest place left in America. Yeah, which is, I I don't know what words to use to express what I think of that. Certainly I wouldn't want my true thoughts to be dumped out on television. But, you know. Bottom line, money talks. That's right. Okay, Tom, if we're done with that, then we're up to Friday, November 27th, and we have an item. Uh, hey, we got a, we got a good-sized graph here, and uh, I would suggest that the people watching the show look at that graph and try to understand it. It's not, it's not difficult. It's a, there's a lot of information on that graph. If we start talking about it, it'd take us 10 minutes. Well, it's got inputs into the electricity grid on the left, and it's got applications on the right. It's a good graph. It's worth looking at. Anyhow, the article says that the world suddenly goes nuts over green ammonia. (laughs) Now that green hydrogen is all hat. And we've been talking about both green hydrogen and green ammonia. Well, you know, this is is amazing because uh, one day, I think it was the day that this came up, I had 15 items on my blog and five of them were about hydrogen or ammonia. (laughs) And a year ago, we weren't talking about either of them. Yeah, we, we. I remember talking about hydrogen and ammonia and the theory behind this, kind of very distantly as an iffy thing. Years ago, I said you could theoretically talk about ammonia, um, and I mentioned the fact that during the Second World War in Belgium, they they used they, it to drive cars. They used it to power buses anyway. And well, okay, buses, cars, no gasoline or diesel. So they they altered the buses to r- run on ammonia because the the German government, which was in control of everything, was not rationing ammonia. But l- let me read what this says. Um, green hydrogen is still clawing its way into the mainstream, and here comes yet another powerful new decarbonization trend, green ammonia. Green ammonia was a big mystery just two years ago, and now all of a sudden it's the next big thing. There's no doubt about it. Green ammonia is a big thing. This is a long article. It's worth reading, but it's a long article. And a quick rundown is because it costs less to store and transport ammonia than hydrogen. Ammonia has the potential as a zero-emission fuel made from hydrogen, which can be produced using electricity from green sources, hence green ammonia. Yeah, and one of the things that's pointed out in this is there's a lot of work that is in progress on how to get the hydrogen to form with atmospheric nitrogen and make ammonia really efficiently, and then, having done that, how to get the hydrogen out of that ammonia really efficiently, releasing the hydrogen, the nitrogen into the atmosphere. And, you know, if you think about the the business of 
Australia, for example, they're talking about making hydrogen and moving it to Japan or to Singapore or wherever. And with green ammonia, you could put more on a, in a given size chip because, because... I think it's eight times more. It's just significant. It is b very significant. And you don't need to have huge, huge, huge heavy tanks for this. You get, well, the tanks would still be huge, but they'd be lightweight because they don't... Lightweight really tanks, right. They don't, they don't have to be highly pressurized like hydrogen does. And, and they don't have to have huge amounts of um, insulation. Cooling. On. That hydrogen is going to have to be stored at close to absolute zero. Absolutely. <laughs> that wasn't a pun. Uh, yeah, I, I, okay. <laughs> you ready to go well, on? one interesting sideline is the seagoing shipping industry is looking at this very closely. Yeah, for their own use. That is that is very important. Uh, shipping is a is a is a very important area. In terms I think we're going to touch base on this before the day's out. I think probably. Okay, we've got an item from renewables now, and we've got pictures of wind turbines in Tasmania. Well, Tasmania's power becomes a hundred percent renewable. Tasmania has become the first state in Australia to operate on 100% renewable power, the state just announced. When uh, the final two turbines in the Granville Harbor wind farm are operating, the state will have uh, uh, 10,741 gigawatt hours of renewable generation per year. That's it's 10 terawatts, 11, isn't it? Yeah. Its average annual demand is for 10,500, so it'll be producing more electricity from renewables than, it, than its demand is. And, of course, one of the things that we've talked about often is a submarine link that connects Tasmania with the mainland of Australia. Um, Tasmania, by the way, has a population that's a little bit lower than the population of Vermont. And is that so? It's, it's a small island that's south of Australia. It's yeah. about three times the size of Vermont. About how many? The island is about three times the size of Vermont. Yeah, I think that's correct. That I was I was going to say between two and a half and three. Yeah. Um, I think it's much closer to three. And this is actually a big deal. Tasmania has a goal to produce two hundred percent of the of the electricity that it has demand for renewably. Which means they're going into business. Exactly. That's what they're doing. They're planning on selling the excess electricity to the state of Victoria. And you know, the state of Victoria. Sure, they don't have any problem with that, as far as I know. Makes sense to me. What's that? It makes sense to me. Yeah, it does. You all set on that? Yeah, let's move along here. we got a picture of, of what it says is a solar system in space, but it's really a solar system in space. <laughs> yes, this is a solar solar. It's a solar panel system in space. Is one exactly. And this is from the BBC. Well, the solar disks that could beam power from space. Now, this is a new uh, concept, beaming power. I'm not sure that I like this. I'm going to have to look into this a little bit more. I don't know what happens. What happens if they suddenly beam that power into my apartment instead of where it's supposed to go? Do I fry? I think yeah. somebody figured that one out already, but I don't know. They're not going to run wires. Yeah, they, they, they have engineers who have looked into these things. I just hope that they have looked into them good and hard. I know they've looked in, into them good and hard. I just hope that they've got it all running properly. Now scientists are working on a concept of a giant, giant solar power station in space that beam energy to Earth. The European Space Agency has realized the potential of these efforts and is looking to fund them. It is predicting that the first industrial resource we get from space is beamed power. And that sounds like something out of out of. Well, it's it's not that mysterious. What they're going to do is convert the electricity into radio waves that would use the radio electromagnetic fields, which are radio waves, to transfer them down to an antenna to the Earth's surface. Right. And they they're basically ra sending down radio signals, very large and heavy radio signals, but radio nevertheless. Yeah. Well. As I said, I, I, I'm a little skeptical about whether this is such a good idea. It might be that it's a great idea. <laughs> well, we have to see how it develops. We do indeed. Let's, let's move along here. we got an interesting picture coming up on Saturday, November 28th. 
And that picture is of the Audi Formula E drivetrain, which is 95% efficient. I was blown away when I read that. What's yeah. 95% efficient? Well, okay. Uh, you can see the car in the background there. And that's not all that very large. That's smaller than a standard internal combustion engine. Yeah. Um, this is from Clean Technica. Um, I think you read the title. I did. Formula E Racing puts a premium on efficiency. Ahead of the start of the Formula E season in Santiago, that's in Chile, next to January, um, Audi announced that its new MGU-05 motor transmission package developed by Audi, Sport, and Schaeffler converts 95% of the energy stored in the battery into forward motion. And, you know, truthfully... You can get 100% efficiency from a from a um, uh, an electric resistance heater, but that's yes, the only, can. only thing I know of that does 100 100% efficiency. The other thing is, I always tell people you don't know what efficiency means unless you know what it means. Well, in most cases, the lack of efficiency, the extra stuff is turned into heat. In most cases, if heat is what you want, you can go 100%. That's absolutely true. I talked to an engineer at Vermont Yankee when it was running, and I said, how, how efficient is your power plant there? And he said, about 35%. And he said, that's really about the best you can get out of a thermal power plant. Um, uh, and the, the extra energy that it doesn't use is converted into heat, as you said, Tom. And it was, it was either released into the atmosphere or it was, it was released into the Connecticut River. And the atmosphere is considered a better place to heat up than the river, but, you know, neither one of them is what I would call an ideal solution. Um, I, I told him, I think your plant is working at less than 1% efficiency. And he laughed about this, and then he said, how do you get that? And I said, well, you're only using 2% of your fuel, and you're getting 35% efficiency out of that. That means out of the uh, converting fuel to electricity, you're getting about two thirds of one percent. And he he laughed a, a little, and then he said, "Yeah, if that's the way you want to deal with efficiency, that's true." As I said, efficiency only is, you don't know what efficiency means unless you know what it means. A little background: It is Formula E is an electric racing series. It's like Formula One, but it's yeah. all electric. Yeah. And each team uses the same battery but free to develop its own motor and transmission packages, which is what Audi has done here. Yeah. And they've done a good job of it. I think they've done a good job of it. Yeah, I think that's probably true. It's um, not only twice as efficient as an internal combustion engine, but only weighs 80 pounds, produces 335 horsepower, wait, and these cars have a top speed of 150 miles an hour. <laughs> How much does this weigh? Zero to 60 in 2.88 seconds. Okay, this is the one that was uh, two seconds. It wasn't the yep. previous car that we were looking at. The, the previous one was a, was a um, was the uh, Shelby. But yep. nevertheless, this thing is impressive. How many pounds did you say it weighed? 80. 80 pounds. 80 pounds. So, yeah. So this is, a, this is pretty lightweight. Yeah. And, of course... They aren't going to be running these cars on the road, but the oh no, these these are these. You know, this is Watkins Glen stuff. Yeah, but the technology they develop is going to wind up being on the road. Well, that's the rationale for formula racing in the first place. Well, you know what I what it reminds me of is you remember Eddie um, Eddie Rickenbacker, who he was. Yeah. Uh, you might even remember seeing him on television or something. He was the head of uh, what was it Eastern Airlines when we were kids. Um, I think he was. Yeah. Eddie Rickenbacker at one time owned, personally owned, the Indianapolis 500 speed, uh, Speedway. Okay. And he drove in the, in the uh, races there. Okay. And one of the things that his um, team developed, which was an invention by somebody on his team, that we can all... Um, uh, relate to because it was really early that this happened is the rear view mirror. No kidding. Yeah, that was Eddie <laughs> Rickenbacker. In, a very impressive man. Um, should we go on, Tom? 
Oh, yeah. We got a good picture coming up here of the Sony building in Tokyo. Yes, and uh, the article is from Recharge. This I found a very interesting article. Sony could shift, this is all, it is interesting. Sony could shift factories out of Japan over a renewable energy drought. Sony warned Japan's government that it would move manufacturing facilities abroad over difficulties sourcing renewable energy for its operations. That's something. That is something, especially in a country like Japan. Chief executives from Sony and other major Japanese companies have demanded reforms to make renewable power pr procurement easier. You know, well, from the article, it's very difficult to purchase renewable energy in Japan. Yeah, the quantity is limited and the price is high. Yeah, and and Sony wants to be able to go to the world and say we're doing this stuff in a very um, in a manner that's very green, and you know. I they try to, try to build their image, and uh, they're having a hard time doing it. Yeah, and of course... Well, they're basically threatening the government. Yeah, this is... They're not going to play by my rules, I'm going to take my football and go home. Yes, but, you know, that... that in, in Japan, Japan has a... The Japanese business community and the, and the government and so forth is very big on loyalty. Yes. And... That one of the results of that is that is if you get a job with a company, you're very likely to continue working for that one company for your entire Forever. life. Forever. Till you retire. Yeah, till you retire. And they aren't going to lay you off, and you're not going to quit and go elsewhere, because because both the company and the employee are loyalty, uh, loyal to each other. And for It's for a the, different model than we have. For Sony to go to the go government and say, we're going to pull these factories out of Japan and move them to wherever... That's it's significant. Significant. Okay, are we done with oh, that? Oh, yeah, we got a very pretty picture coming up. Yeah, and it's uh, we're, we're moving to Sunday, November 29th. The picture is the mountains in Canmore, Alberta. That, by the way, is the main street in Cal Calmore, Alberta. Okay. And this is an article from Clean Technica. Electrify Canada, that's a company, expands into Alberta. Um, Electrify Canada, which is a partner of Electrify America, as well as the Volkswagen Group Canada, is spreading ultra-fast EV charging stations across Canada. Now it's expected it, it's expanded to Alberta, which of course is the home of of oil and gas, and oil and gas, and I think also oil and gas. That's it's, where the oil sands are. That's right. It's the first Alberta charging station. It's in Canmore, which is this, the town we're looking at. But an ultra-fast char ultra fast charging station is coming to Calgary soon. Canada well, they're planning to build a network of rechargeable stations across the country, which yeah. has to happen. Yeah, oh, it'll happen. It has to happen here, too. It has to happen it here. It will. And, you know, Alberta is also moving into the 21st century with its, with its um, uh, electric renewable technology. They can't the first phase of this uh, plan is 32 stations with a total of 128 individual DC fast chargers. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we're on the way to We got another one of those funny looking things again, huh? And we do. This one I think is not actually a windmill, a wind turbine. I think it's a, it is a party noisemaker. But don't let that bother you. <laughs> I've got a little uh, cartoon that I've saved. It's a, it's a picture of a guy selling, like he sells vegetables off your farm. Yeah. He's selling tiny wind turbines right yeah. next to a wind turbine, and they're pinwheels. Yeah. Toy pinwheels. Yes. Okay, what do you got for a title on this beautiful picture of a wind turbine? -E Dogger Bank. World's yeah. largest offshore wind farm will use 190 GE Hollyod X turbines, and they're 13 Hollyod X 13s. It's a big tur that's the biggest turbine you can buy right now. Yeah, um, Equinor and and SSE Renewables announced that they are having they are they have financing for the first two phases of Dogger Bank Wind Farm which will be in the North Sea about 160 kilometers, that, as I recall, is 100 miles uh, east of Yorkshire. That puts it right in the middle of the... Of the uh, it's uh, right in the middle of the North Sea. Absolutely. 
will be powered by 190 GE Holiade X 13 megawatt turbines. These turbines are the biggest turbines. I, I would say they're the biggest turbines ever made, but they really haven't been made yet. They're, they're gigantic. Oh, they've they're, made 12s, but they haven't made 13s. Right. And, and you know, the, the 12s have been have been certified. The 13s, since they, have, they haven't been made, they still haven't been certified. But G, here GE has just sold 190 of them, and they aren't even aren't even made yet. No, they're just no, tweaking the 12s, really. Yeah, they're it, tweaking It's the not a major overhaul. It's basically oh. the 12, but they've tweaked it. And then they've get, I think they've given it longer uh, blades, but it, that, that's possible. The, those blades on that turbine, well, as it exists as it exists out to sea, each of those blades will be a little bit longer than a football field. Those things are 107 just, meters. That's 350 feet. Okay. Just imagine that you stand it on on end. It's going to be 35 stories tall. Put Absolutely. That yeah, put that next to Brooks' house and see how how uh, big of a shadow it casts. Well, as you said, they're a little bit longer than a football field. Right, and for those of you who don't know, I think Brooks' house cubicle is what fourth story. That's a tall building for Brattleboro. Yes, yes, it is. Okay, should we go on, Tom? Well, I'm trying to see if I got anything else to add here. SSE will construct the farm while it is going to construct the farm, but Equinor is going to run it. Not a big deal. <laughs> it's expected to begin producing in 2023. You know, I, I, I just had a thought. I don't know how many people are going to be employed building this wind farm, but when the wind farm is running, there's going to be a lot of people going out to that wind farm and doing service on it because in most of these places, the turbines have to be serviced by hand at least once a week. And uh, that with turbines this tall, they're gonna that that means that servicing the turbine is going to be uh, mean that at least one person is going to have to climb a 35-story vertical ladder up and then down again. And well, do it's that. inside of the tube. And and then and then to get to the next turbine, you've got to get on a boat and and go <laughs> on the boat to the next turbine. And the, of course. These, they're they going to create a lot of jobs. They're going to create a lot of jobs. Yeah, I think I think it's probably going to be four hours to to service one turbine, so one person could service two turbines a day, and there that means one person could service ten turbines a, a week, which means you'd have at least nineteen service technicians. But I don't think they're going to work singly. I think that, I, my bet is they'd work in pairs, and while they're working, somebody's going to be on that boat. And probably a couple of people are going to be on that boat doing. Oh, I think you're absolutely right. You know, this is going to be, you know, a lot of people that, who are who are working, and of course, it's going well, to be. Well, uh, Boris Johnson, who's the prime minister, has said we believe that in ten years, offshore wind will be powering every house in the country. That's what he said. Yep. Okay, we're up to Monday, November thirtieth, and we've got an item here from Clean Technica and a picture. Oh, of we've got a little picture of a pickup truck. Yeah. It's a long and interesting article. It's both long and it's interesting. It's it's infuriating, really. But go ahead, Tom. Diesel cheeking may involve millions of pickup trucks. Well, it also involves millions of big trucks. But this article is about pickups. Yeah, and it and these are just the the medium and large size pickups. They don't the article the the study that they did did not study small pickups that might have diesel engines. An EPA report estimates 557,478 medium and heavy-duty trucks have been fitted with emissions defeat devices. The cumulative effect of the extra pollution coming from their exhaust pipes is estimated to equal the emissions from nearly 10 million fully compliant diesel pickups. Now, well, apparently they believe, or it's true, I don't know which, that they uh, believe that these things sap power and fuel economy, and they also require maintenance, which costs money. Well, the the defeat devices that they've got, though, it looks to me like these are software. And you Basically, can... you're uh, absolutely right. They are software. They're, they're not mechanical things. Yeah, you patch the, the software into the computers in the in the truck, and once that's done, you know, that, and you can't tell just by looking... You could tell if you... It's fooling the truck 
to do something different than the truck thinks it's doing. That's right, and it's fooling the the uh, EPA and the and the and the emissions te uh, testing stuff. And it's basically well, the EPA is not directly testing the emissions like they should be. Rather, they're looking at the computers that are in the car, and that's what this that that's what's being cheated. The electronics. Okay. Should we go on? Why not? Got a nice picture nice? here of the named storm tracks in 2020. By the way, this picture was not at CNN. They had a similar picture at CNN, but I wanted to get one that had no um, uh, copyright status because a lot of the pictures that I use for my blog get picked up by by uh, places that where they're reposted. And I want to make sure that there's no copyright issues when that happens. Yeah, that's, uh, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay, what do you got for a title for this? Named Storm Tracks in 20... Well, that's what that's a car... <laughs> that's the name of the picture. Historic 2020 Atlantic hurricane season comes to a close. And by the way, this is a long but interesting article from it, CNN. It is indeed. Uh, November 30th officially marks the final day of the Atlantic hurricane season, and it was one for the record books. And I, I would add in a bunch of different ways. 2020 Many ways. It's breaking records right and left. Right and left. It was undoubtedly a crazy year with COVID-19 and record-breaking wildfires, but the hurricane season stands out, setting a bunch of records of its own. We got, the United States got hit by more hurricanes, more big hurricanes. It was absolutely crazy. And this is something that is becoming the rule rather than the exception in the last uh, in the last 20 years, it's just been getting worse and worse. Well, the warmer air holds more moisture, and more moisture uh, feeds these storms. Yes, and they're they're going over water that's that is sometimes eight degrees warmer than it was, um, you know, 30, 40 years ago. So Absolutely. Where the where the water was warm enough 30 or 40 years ago to 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 power a hurricane. Today it's warm enough to, to power not just a hurricane, but a major hurricane. I think you can say this is the new normal. Yeah, this is the new normal. There's no question about it. And I wonder if Louisiana is going to last. But, you know, what can I say? They got hit pretty hard this year. And <laughs> last year Houston got pummeled. What yes. was it, 13 inches of rain or some stupid thing like that? I, I have no idea, but it was bad. Okay, we've got an item from BBC. and a, got picture a picture of, of the Hydro Bingo. <laughs> it's a hydrogen-powered craft. It's a catamaran. It is. It is. It's like a neat boat. It does, doesn't it? Yeah. Okay. What do you got for a title? The ships powered by green hydrogen. It's from the BBC. Yep. Ships emit 3% of all greenhouse gases, and emissions are projected to grow by up to 50% by 2050 if the industry continues on a business-as-usual path, which it will not. Green hydrogen and ammonia derived from it can replace oil used in ships, and their use in boats, which is now are, uh, are now being introduced, can be scaled up. So boats are being built that take this, takes this stuff. I will say, if you burn ammonia in an internal combustion engine, yeah. I don't think that's necessarily a good idea because you could, in theory, you get up, some oxides of nitrogen. You'd get exactly. And those are not good, but you don't have to burn it. And we've seen internal combustion engines are nowhere near as efficient as electric motors. And this ammonia can be used in um, fuel cells to create electricity. And the and all it gives off is hydrogen and nitrogen. And of course, if the hydrogen is is I mean I'm sorry yeah that's right the hydrogen is given off, the nitrogen is given off, the hydrogen is used in the fuel cell to combine with oxygen to make water. So you've got... The nitrogen and air is 90, 80% nitrogen anyhow. Yeah, and then you've got water, and so what? So you've got um, wet nitrogen. That's right. Okay, <laughs> we have to keep going. Um, well, the, ship, the shipping industry is really interested in this for their own use. Yes, well, we have Tuesday, December 1st coming up, and we've got a picture of a hydrogen-powered train. Which is a little unusual, but it won't be unusual all that long. This is from the BBC. It actually doesn't exist yet. <laughs> it's being built as we speak. Yes, that's right. I was going to say these things will be along pretty soon. 
Climate have, change temperature analysis shows UN goals are within reach. This is one of the most hopeful uh, uh, articles I've seen recently, and it comes from the um, Climate Action Tracker, which is generally in the past been pretty negative. The Climate Action Tracker Group looked at a new high climate promises from China and from other nations, along with the carbon plans of U.S. President-elect Joe Biden. Its analysis is more optimistic, suggesting that the goals of the U.N. Paris Climate Agreement are getting within reach. And by well, the, the article is pretty negative about that. And a uh, quick takeaway here, there's a nice graph. And it says, experts are worried the long-term optimism is not matched by short-term plans to cut CO2. Yeah. Um, the sh yes. That's the, I, I said this was an optimistic article. It's something that I took as optimistic. Sometimes I take things differently than other people do. Um, I see this. Oh, it's a warning. It's basically what they're, what, what they're telling us. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but they're saying that it's that if things move properly, we could be facing a uh, um, the temperature upside of 2.1 degrees Celsius, where we're committed to 2.0, which is you know that puts additional stuff, new technology, things like that would change that that temperature downward into safer territory. Well, we are moving in that direction. We are. Okay, we're, we're not there yet, but we are. At least we're trying. That's right. Now we've got a picture of a hydrogen-powered train, a different one. The same train. Huh? It's the same train, just a different view. Is it really? Yeah, look at the other one. No, I don't think it is. The colors, yeah, sure it is. Neither train exists yet. Well, the, the, this particular train is... That train was in the in the uh, UK, and this one is in Italy, and um, this train has actually got an order. They they actually have this on order. So yeah. anyway, what do you have for a? It's not the same train. It's a very similar train. It's a, this is the Italian there. version of the UK train. That's exactly right. Um, well, okay. what, what the article says is that Allstorm, a company, to supply Italy's first six. Hydrogen trains. I missed that. I missed that oh. it was happening in Italy. Yeah, Alstom is will supply six hydrogen fuel trains, uh, fuel cell trains, with an option for eight more, to um, FNM, the main transport and mo mobility group in the Italian region of Lombardy, for a total amount of, pro of approximately 160 million euros, which is going to be what about 185 or 100. 185 or 190 million. Said 193. 193. My, my converter said 193. Well, that changes daily. The it's a significant train. amount of euro of dollars. It's almost 200 million. The first train delivery is expected within 36 months. So these things are actually going. They're being into made production. as we speak. Yes, they're going into production. And Lombardy so, is the middle, the central part of northern Italy, adjoining Switzerland. Okay. Now we have a picture. Um, this is from Recharge of Simic Atlantis AR. Yeah, that, that's that's an underwater turbine. Look at the blades. Yes, yeah. short blades. It it looks like a it looks like a wind turbine that is odd. <laughs> <laughs> Very odd. And that yeah. the yellow structure there is where it's gonna it's gonna sit on the ocean floor. Yes. And as the tide goes in and the tide goes out, each time the tide moves, which is four times a day, it's going to be generating electricity. So it's going right. to be busy, busy little guy. Yes, this is from Recharge. What do you got for a title? Global Ocean Renewable Energy Could Reach 10 Gigawatts by 2030, buoyed by island and coastal markets. Um, ocean energy could grow 20-fold this decade to reach 10 gigawatts of supplied capacity with tidal and wave plants providing mainstream power generation according to the calculations of the International Renewable Energy Agency. And I want to point out that turbine that we see there is not exactly small. That's that's pretty big. Um, well, it's not uh, the size, the blades aren't the size of a football field. That's probably about a quarter of the size of the largest air turbines they're making right now. Well, 
I would say that in a cell is about the size of a city bus. Yeah, that could be. I can believe that. And anyway. uh, some of the cells now will take, they're big enough to hold three or four buses. Yep. Okay, we're up to the 2nd of December, which is Wednesday, and we have a picture here of a Ford Mustang. Well, something interesting about that picture, it doesn't have a grill. I suspect the picture, they didn't, the article didn't say that, but I suspect the picture is a prototype of an electric car. And I got a picture oh. next to it that I can see of a, of a 2020 Ford Mustang. And it's similar, but it's not the same car. Okay. I didn't know that. This one is from Clean Technica. What do you have for a title? Ford presses other manufacturers to join the CARB emissions rules package. According to Reuters, Ford has sent a letter to Toyota, FCA, and other automakers who are still opposing tougher admissions standards that urge and that urge them the letter urges them to get on board with the California standards before Joe Biden takes office in January. I was struck by the fact that they want them to do this before Joe Biden takes office. Well, they and want to get away with it before he changes the rules. I think that's exactly correct. He, he, they want to get some kind of unanimity and a display of, of an industry-wide effort um, before they run up against things changing. Well, most of the car manufacturers are on board with this. Yes. But we got Toyota and FCA, which is Fiat Chrysler, and a few yes. other auto manufacturers are dragging their feet. Yes. Okay, we have a picture here of cultured chicken. Cultured Looks pretty cultured to me, to me there, doesn't it? Yeah. The cultured, by the way, does not in, indicate anything about the education the chickens got. This is from the Straits Times, which, by the way, is published. Well, I was envisioning all these chickens reading books. <laughs> yeah, you and me both. What do you got for a title on this? In a world first, cultured... In a, it's, 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 it's almost doesn't make sense. In a world first... Culture chicken meat approved for sale in Singapore. Oh, a world it's it's a world first. Okay, culture chicken meat is approved for sale in, in, in Singapore. Right, the world's first cell cultured meat product, which is bite sized chicken by a California startup called Just. Uh, I'm sorry, called Eat Just, will be available at rec restaurants in Singapore now that authorities have ruled it's safe for consumption. The cultured chicken bites will be produced locally. And that is an issue that I think is very, very important. They can raise I agree with you. It makes a lot of, a lot of sense. It, it means does, uh, how much does it take to get a loaf of lettuce on your table you know, in a form of transportation? Yeah. And, and here or a the, piece of chicken, for that matter. The, this is going to be a much more efficient way of, of producing chicken meat. And this is actual chicken meat. The only thing is it doesn't come from a chicken. It comes... Exactly. It is chicken meat. It is chicken meat. If you it's not look synthetic at it, chicken meat. It is chicken meat. You could, you could say, yeah, this is clearly chicken meat, but it doesn't come from a chicken. It comes from a test tube, sort of. Well, what the article says, the meat is created in large cultivators that resemble a beer brewery. Yes. And it is safer, cleaner, and more efficient than raising animals at farms. Now, Production doesn't not... require antibiotics and do right. doesn't suffer from E. coli, salmonella, and other contamination. Right. And on top of everything else, you don't have to murder chickens to get the meat. And Bingo. On top of everything else, you don't need a lot of agricultural fields to, uh, to uh, uh, let them out if they're cage-free or to grow the the feed that you give to them. You don't have chickens that are pinned up in pens or in Much cages. more efficiently use of real estate. Yeah, much more efficient. And, of course, Singapore is not known for a lot of real estate. <laughs> I know. Uh, I think it's smaller than the, 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 what we, the... What's the Australian state we just looked at? Tasmania? Singapore is small. It's only a city-state. It's only a city state. Singapore is tiny compared to yeah. Tasmania. I mean, Singapore is and tiny. very wealthy. I think Singapore is tiny compared to Rhode, Rhode Island, but it's got. A I think lot. it is too. Yeah, it's got a lot of people in it. It's got millions and millions and millions of people. So, and 
that's where you get sent to jail if you spit on the sidewalk. Do you? I didn't know that. <laughs> okay, we're well, all right. This alternative protein is more sustainable as large volumes can be produced with relatively small amounts of land and labor. Yeah. yeah that's that's right. just what you said. It is not an agricultural product anymore. It is an industrial product. Yep. But as we've been stressing, if you look at it under a microscope, you're going to see cells of that are from chicken because this is cloned cells they're growing. And I'm not sure. I think there are certain things about this that I don't particularly like, but there's a lot about this that I do like. So I'm I'm a little iffy on it, but only a little. Well, in the long run, we are going to be not we're not going to be able to raise enough meat for the population using farms. There just isn't enough land. Yes. And, this and is we're not of, there yet, but it's, it's coming. Yeah, this is one of the ways that we can do that. So we're up to our last, this our last, last item, yep. item, which is an item from CNN, and this is astonishing. We have a picture of a nodding donkey. Yep, that's what they call him. Exxon faces a $20 billion hit from an epic failure of a decade ago. Yeah. Exxon there's, there's a two-and-a-half-minute video called Boom and Bust that's worth looking at, yeah. and it's about it's, shale. Yeah. Exxon Mobil's nightmarish 2020 has just got worse. The energy company announced that it will mark down the value of its natural gas uh, properties these, by the way, are not in Alberta. This is in the Permian Basin in Texas. Texas, but right. $17 billion to $20 billion. Exxon also promised to scale back its spending ambitions as it braces for a m more muted oil recovery. You know, Tom, I don't think there's going to be an oil recovery. I think, I think oil... I, I would not vote against that or bet against that. I think you're right. You know, I think the renewables have gotten so cheap now that thinking about buying fuel is wasteful thinking. Well, you know, there was an article that came up today, and we will be talking about this. Uh, it might be the first one we're going to have next week that, that shows the increase in energy storage. And it shows that the, the energy storage that was built in the third quarter of 2020 the number of, of megawatts of energy storage built is about, I think it was it was an increase of 140 percent from the previous quarter. And it, you know this energy storage is, is is growing so fast it's just unbelievable. And no one that, would have predicted it. Huh? No one would have predicted it. Well. I, I think there were people who I, I did certainly didn't predict that energy storage was going to be growing that fast. I think there were a few people um, uh, who kind of had that in, in their minds that it could. And I honestly think that that, um, that Elon Musk was probably one of those one of those people. And uh, what was that guy's name? Tony Seba is is another guy. He's a he's a future. He's a guy who looks at, at trends and predicts futures, and he's been talking about um, these things growing very fast. This is this is we're we're in the turn here. We're 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 turning to a point where things are going to be different a year from now than they are now. I can tell you that. Oh yeah, we're at, definitely entering a new era. We're we've been for a while, and it's just getting faster. And yep. you know the, the anyway. We're at the end of our show, Tom. So. Well, we'll close it from this article, from the article. As recently as 2012, Exxon was the world's most valuable co company. Yeah. Current market valuation has crumbled by more than half. And you know what? I read an article yesterday, and it, I, I wanted to put it in, but I just didn't have room for it. It said um, it gave the market capitalization of Tesla, and then it pointed out that the market capitalization of Tesla was greater than the market capitalization of General Motors plus the market capitalization of Ford plus the market capitalization of Toyota plus the market capitalization of one other company. It's like – When is this going to stop? It, well, it isn't. And the reason – Yeah, that's, that's the point. If these guys in GM – GM is trying to is – trying, GM is, is making up for lost time. And they're, they're, they're certainly trying to. 
they're trying to. They realize they missed the boat, you know. They've been saying, "Hey, we do, we do what we do best." Uh -uh. And and they missed the boat. Bingo. Okay, we're at the end of the show, Tom. We got to go. Well, it's been so fun. We will um, we will invite everybody at, back for our next show, and with any kind of luck, we'll do our 400th show this this month. We have a party. Yeah, we should. We'll invite <laughs> everybody, but nobody will come. Okay. <laughs> See you next time, everybody. Adios.